uncomfortable when I speak. All right, can everybody hear me? No? Everybody hear me now? I practiced this speech last night. It took about an hour and a half. <laughs> so y'all will be well rested. We all fall asleep by the time y'all are going home. It's seven. Can you hear me now? Any speak right here? My name is Joey, I'm with a company called Medicare Solutions, and I can speak freely and say that my uh, two colleagues, Belinda Vasquez and Lisa Streeter, were very honored and pleased to be able to close this uh, conference out. Thank you, ladies. Uh, Medicare Solutions, basically, we're in, in, the, in the community and we help people organize their Medicare benefits. And we have the privilege of designing the new website. You know what, I do need help, ladies, because I don't have my presentation up, my slides. Can somebody come and work the computer for me? I'm sorry, I'm putting them on the spot. Hang tight, I'm coming. Yes, it's over here. I'll go like this, like I'm losing again. Um, back in the 1960s, while the uh, country was in the midst of the civil rights movement, a woman here in San Antonio, Texas, decided to stage her own civil rights movement. And it's interesting to note that her story is not as good as you hear. That's usually how my speeches go. <laughs> I think that was a cumbia. Um, her story wasn't as interesting as I could hear, um, like the Martin Luther King's the I Have a Dream speech, or maybe it was Cesar Chavez in the Si Se Puede movement. But it's interesting to note that what she decided to do in the civil rights arena affects each and every person in this room. Go ahead, Yes. Um, this lady's name was Josefina Urquizo Guajardo, and she's in the upper right hand corner. She grew up in a little town in the northern part of Mexico called, called Nueva Rosita in the state of Coahuila. And Josefina, she, she was somebody. Growing up, she had a family that was going somewhere. You see, Josefina's dad, he was, he was, he was running for mayor. He wanted to do something for the people that didn't know how to speak out in his community. And he had the attention of the people, he had the attention of the voters, and he had the momentum to win. Josefina was really proud of him as she was growing up. But you see, Josefina's dad, he made a fateful, fateful mistake. He knew that he had to speak the language of the people so that he could get the vote. And he decided to do something one day that he would later regret. You see, when I was taking one of my uh, bicultural bilingual classes, um, early education classes, I had a professor that once told me that if you want to be able to speak to children, if you want to be able to communicate to children, you have to speak their language. Well, what that professor did that one time when I, when I went to class, because I wasn't really good at attending class, um, he did something that, that made an impression on me. And quite literally, he did this. He said, you have to speak the language that kids speak. You have to laugh the way they laugh. You have to do the things they do. And what he did next, it really impressed me. And what he said is that you act, literally have to look at them eye to eye. You see, Josefina's father knew that. He had to speak their language, and he did. Well, one day, he decided to campaign at the bottom of a mine. He went, he went down the mine to speak to the miners, to campaign to them, because they loved them so much. He knew he had to go down there. He was going to speak to those people. Well, his, his political rival, took advantage of the situation, and he threw a stick of dynamite in the mine and blew it up. Josefina told me that several weeks later, her mom passed away too because of a broken heart. And just like that, Josefina was an orphan. Now, I looked up some, there's a surprise in the box. I looked up some information on what an orphan feels or what it feels like to be an orphan. And I found this excerpt on Google. I'm gonna read it to you, and it says, and I quote, yes, 
We are orphans. I am an orphan, not by birth, but by destiny. And we are normal human beings. We have random thoughts. We too have feelings and certainly have hopes, aspirations, and desires. We would love to share the same with people close to us, but then who is closer to us? We are all alone, left to fend for ourselves. No parents, no close family members, no relatives, and no permanent home." End quote. An idea of what it feels like to be an orphan. See, eventually, go ahead and reflect. Eventually, Josefina fell in love with a man. His name was Santiago Guajardo. That's the big guy on the right-hand side. This is a, a newer picture than the previous picture that you saw. They crossed into the United States with three kids, and I believe it was about five different pieces of luggage. And they were here in the United States. Santiago, he was a good guy. The thing he was good at was working. He made enough money to support the family, but when it came to the home, when it came to being a good father, a good husband, that was an entirely different story. You see, back then, times were different. Times were way different than what they are now. Um, their daughter, Olga, would tell me that when they were growing up in the school district that she went to, there was a rule, and that rule was say it in English. Whereas if you spoke Spanish in school, guess what they would do to you? They would spank you, corporal punishment. To survive, Santiago and, uh, and Josefina, they had to pick fruit. Because back then there was no food stamp. There was segregation. Go ahead and hit it once more. This is my favorite picture. That's the way they made their living. Josefina and Santiago were poor. They only ate meat once a week. They had to pick fruit to survive. And Santiago was a very domineering husband. One moment. That's him on the left. See, they had, a, they had a variation of things that they could eat. It was rice and beans, or rice and beans. Or maybe frijoles borrachos with rice, or frijoles refritos with rice. If you're not laughing, you don't understand Spanish. <laughs> Josefina's husband was so domineering that she knew she had to do something because if she didn't do something to control the way that he was acting, did y'all like that joke back there? <laughs> Uh, she knew that she, if she didn't control Santiago, it was going to mean the demise of her family. But you see, Josefina, she had a trick up her sleeve. She had, a, she had that, that card that you're always looking for when you play poker. See, when I play poker, I always want to get that royal flush. Everybody knows what a royal flush is. It's an ace, king, queen, jack, and ten, all in the same suit. That's the best hand you can, you can get. Ask me if I've ever gotten the answer is no. It's that rare. Well, Josefina, she was, she was holding that card up her sleeve. She had that card for her family. You see, she had to build up because Santiago would tear down. And I can give you an example of how she would build up. See, when I was growing up, I told her once how nervous I was getting because I had to give a presentation. I believe it was in about the third grade. I told her, I can't keep it in my head. I, I start shaking. I, I forget everything. And she gave me some very wise words. She said, why are you going to get nervous when nobody else in the auditorium is nervous? In fact, I guarantee you that everybody's falling asleep. <laughs> the words that I use today. She also had some other uh, words of wisdom. She told me one time that you'll never have enough, you'll never have enough money. Go ahead. One more time. Some guy, I heard this guy say the same exact words Josefina said about 20, 20 years later, right? She would have been able to capitalize that way back when. Go ahead and hear it one more time. That was little Wayne. <laughs> See, the, the card or the trick that Josefina had up her sleeve, it was something personal and it was something dear to her. And that was her love and patience that she had for her kids. You see, as Santiago would use her as her own punching bag, as his own personal punching bag, she knew that the only thing that stood between him and her kids was her. She knew that love and patience was the key, and she helped out. She built up Jimmy, Mayo, Willen, Yolanda, Olga, 
Candy, you're going too fast now. And he'll go. Oh, not that guy, that guy right there. But you see, the abuse, abuse, it got to be really great. The abuse was on a, on a, on a grand scale. And one day, Josefina had to make a decision. It was a hard decision. It was either continue to let Santiago abuse her and beat her up and possibly one day be killed or handle Santiago and maybe only have to go to jail for a little while. You see, Josefina knew what it was to be an orphan and she didn't want her children to be orphans like she grew up. Meat at the uh, Oaxaca residence was usually only served on Friday. And it was a Tuesday when she decided to kill the chicken, pull out the feathers, right, I was a boy back then, and cook the meat. And Santiago was, thought she was crazy. Vieja loca. What is she doing? I mean, we only eat meat on Fridays. Well, she was cooking the chicken. The, the kids were still at school. They were almost home. And when the kids got off the bus, and this was off of, uh, does everybody know where Old Highway 90 and Commerce meet over there on the west side of San Antonio? It was around that neighborhood. When the kids got off the bus, they couldn't believe their noses. They couldn't believe it. Chicken on Tuesday? They were getting excited. All seven of them were getting excited. You see, Josefina, she served Santiago with strategy. The stove was here. The table was over here. She served all the kids their favorite piece. Every kid knew what piece of chicken they were going to get. And she served Santiago the best piece of chicken. And she served him that piece of chicken so that he would have his back to her as she cooked. And she served him the chicken, she put it on the table, and Santiago started to eat. And she told him, I'm going to make you something special. He's like, there's nothing left. I mean, there's the chicken, there's the beans, there's no other money to make anything else special. So, Josefina turns on the gas stove, and there was one of those old gas stoves where you could boil a pot of water in like 30 seconds because it got so hot. You know those old stoves that her grandmas used to have? She puts the skillet on the stove, and she gets it hot. And she gets a stick of butter, the Land Lakes. That's my favorite butter, and that's in that rectangle, right? She throws it in the skillet, and she's moving the skillet, and she's moving the skillet. She doesn't want the butter to stick to the pan. She's moving the skillet. She reaches for some garlic. She throws it in there, and everybody knows how good and yummy garlic and butter smell. She had, she had that scent going to their home. And she's waiting. She knows the kids are almost home. She's, she has a strategy, right? And she's moving the pan around, and the pan's getting hot. It's starting to get red. The heat's traveling up the handle. So she has to get a rag to hold, a towel to hold the, the skillet. And it was time. It was time. So no Lisa Streeter, this is not a Tyler Perry movie. This is a, this is a true story. She lifts up the skillet, and some butter falls on her head, so it burns her, and when she swings at Santiago, the skillet starts to slip out of her hand. She, she has to hit him. She has to. She's already, he's already seen it. Well, fortunately, she, she did hit him, right? He made a big red, she made a big red chicha on the back of his forehead, right? And if you don't know what that means, ask your neighbor. <laughs> and she dropped the skillet. And Santiago's face landed at the chicken. Anybody that has kids knows that kids are never quiet. Well, all seven kids saw what Josefina did to Santiago. And they were all quiet. Nobody could believe their eyes. And they're, they're looking. Well, Jimmy, the oldest kid, he knew what he, exactly what he had to do. He went for the gun. He knew it. Josefina tells him, Siéntate. Sit down. She told all the kids, Coma. Eat. Anybody that grew up in a, in a Hispanic household knows that an adult never tells a child coma because when you conjugate eat in Spanish, that literally means, literally means please eat. Grandparents always tell grandchildren, or excuse me, always tell their children, comen, eat. 
the command. She, but she asked him, please eat, come on. She told him, no yore, don't cry. And they all sat around the table and they cried and they talked to mom about their day and they knew dad was gonna wake up. And eventually Santiago did wake up. And it took him a little while, right? He woke up, he looked around and he stood up and we all can imagine that sound that a chair makes, a wooden chair makes on a wooden floor and it made that sound. And he looked around at all the kids and all the kids looked at him. Josefina didn't look at him. She just stared straight at the wall. And Santiago lifted up his arm and she was gonna, he was gonna hit her right in the ear. It was only gonna take one shot. But you see, Josefina built up and she built up her kids. And that trick, it came out her sleeve. That card came out her sleeve. And when Jimmy, the oldest son, saw Santiago lift up his arm, he jumped on the table and jumped and grabbed Santiago's arm. And that's all that Mayo, his younger brother, needed because Mayo loved to be, he wanted to be a boxer. And he jumped up and started punching Santiago in the stomach. And then here comes Hilda. She bites Santiago on the Achilles tendon. Olga's trying to kick him in the shin. Uh, Yolanda does the best thing that I know today that she can do. And she just yelled. She's yelling. <laughs> All the kids attack dad because they love mom so much. I know what y'all are thinking. What a lovely family, right? What a loving family. <laughs> but Josefina's trick, it came out her sleeve. And you can see what the family looked like. Go ahead and hit that. Several years later. Go ahead and hit it again. Does everybody remember that uh, restaurant called Carol's? That was there before it closed down. Again, yeah. And one more time. It was back in the day. It was the best, best technology you had to offer with that big video camera. I remember Josefina saying that once she was able to do that, it really liberated her. See, Santiago never hit her again because Santiago knew that if he was ever going to be abusive to Josefina, he was going to have to go through seven people to get through her, which was all her kids. She had a team. And Josefina eventually became an advocate. She would go from house to house around the neighborhood telling everybody how she beat up Santiago. And if wives had, she was her own task force, right? Wives ever had a uh, problem with their husband, all they had to do was ask her how she did it. And you would hear stories in the neighborhood how my husband would come home, maybe he was a little bit intoxicated, and you'd have a wife hiding in the corner, and when he turned the corner, they'd take care of that. Now the million dollar question is this, what would have happened if Josefina would have never taken that stand against Santiago? Asked differently, where would all of Josefina's children, their great-grandchildren, or grandchildren and great-grandchildren be today if she would have never, if she would have allowed Santiago to abuse her even more? Two very, very popular questions, or powerful questions. Go ahead and one more time. You see, you don't have to be big to be a hero. And this is how I remember Josefina Guajardo, my grandmother. Five feet tall, with curly. She had the biggest heart, but when you got out of line, she was gonna let you know about it. And she was gonna put some clamps on you until you adjusted. You see, to be a hero, all you have to do is decide to take action and then take action. And the rest will work itself out. Take, for example, this lady, Stephanie Decker, a mother of two, who stood between her kids and an F4 tornado back in 2012. Now people say that the tornado didn't stand a chance. Why? Because Stephanie decided to do something about it. Stephanie didn't stay sitting on the couch when she saw the tornado coming towards her home. She grabbed the kids, went to the basement, threw a blanket on top of them, and jumped on top of the blanket to protect her kids. And as the house blew up, Part of it fell on her, and, it, and she had to have both legs amputated. Now, 
she survived and the kids were okay, which is the most important part. But because of that tornado and what she did, now she's a motivational speaker and she has her own foundation. Take for example, the next two. This is, excuse me, D'Artagnan Crockett, the gentleman that's walking. He's a blind wrestler and Leroy Sutton, a wrestler with no legs. Both of these young men are from a poor area of Cleveland where it's almost guaranteed that they will fail. Why? Only a 40% high school success rate. Did that stop them? No. D'Artagnan went on to win a medal in the 2012 Paralympics in London and, our, and Leroy is currently in college. You see, you have to understand this next point. The problems you encounter is the personification of the person that you want to become. Let me say that again. The problems that you encounter is the personification of a person you want to become. Now, I know you're saying, has he lost his mind? No, not yet. It's still on there. You see, have you ever, have you ever seen a problem on the horizon? Maybe it's a problem coming, a problem coming down at, at the hall down the hall towards you. Maybe it is domestic violence. Maybe it is a tornado. Maybe it's a flood. Maybe it's a gunman. You see, your problems, can, they can literally kill you or you can decide to take action and do something about it and beat your problems to death. And then you actually take on the qualities of the personification of the problem. For example, have, every, have any of your problems come towards you wearing a pink dress, maybe two feet tall? None of your problems look easy. None of your problems are nice. None of, the, none of your problems talk to you in a nice manner. They're not sexy. Your problems are mean and nasty. But your, your problem, if you handle it, can become the fuel to propel you to do something great. Just like it happened with Stephanie Decker and D'Artagnan and Leroy. See, what type of person would Josefina become if she, would, if she wouldn't have gone through that hardship? Or would Stephanie Decker have become the lady she is today if she wouldn't have faced that tornado? The answer is no. See, domestic violence, especially in the senior community, it's never, it's never a good thing. But you, I want everybody to put their hand on their chest, you, you are the, the reason that our seniors succeed. You are the reason. And the task force is the reason. Without the people in this room and without the task force, people might not stand a chance out there. And we know how bad it can get. So. We are very honored to be a part of this organization, and I can speak for Belinda and Lisa. Thank you for this opportunity. So just as Josefina found a team to help her fight her own domestic abuse, so today our seniors find help with the task force. So what's the best part of all this long-winded story? Is that that guy in the middle, go ahead and click it again, met that woman in the middle, go ahead and click it. And that little kid came out. That's a big binky. There she is in the hat. Next one. Man, that's a nice tuxedo. And that is the result of what Josefina was able to do when she stood up to Santiago Guajara. In case you haven't figured it out, it's me. Okay. <laughs> As we look to help our own fellow seniors, we all, we all now have a trick up our sleeves. And we're pleased to announce this new brand, this brand new website. The URL is stopelderdomesticviolence.org, the newest tool to fight domestic violence, excuse me, in the San Antonio area. So we need to do a little bit of housekeeping. Can everybody take out their phone, please? Can everybody take out their phone? 
I'm going to take mine out and we'll do it at the same time. Please go, please jump on the internet and type stop elder domestic violence dot org. If you have a high, uh, an iPhone, hit go. That was stop elder domestic violence dot org. The website that Lisa Bullard and I have been able to create, it's a mobile website. So what it basically does, it adjusts to the screen. So if you have an iPhone or an Android device, or if you have an iPad, or if you're at your desktop, it'll adjust to your screen, which is great, because you don't want a uh, website to eat up all your data. Um, those that have their phone right now, right under the, the logo, there's a, a box that says, help stop elder domestic violence. If everybody will put in where it says name, and people that don't have their cell phone today, you'll see the website, it's in the upper right hand corner, where it says name. Type in your name. And type in the email that you are going to keep for a really long time. So it might not be your work email, it might be your private email. It might be your hot, Hotmail email or your Yahoo email, whatever that is. Once you do that, please hit submit. I'm gonna give you all a second to do that. After you hit submit, you'll get an, an email stating if you wanna confirm your subscription. The answer is yes, please uh, confirm because that is how we will be able to communicate with everybody that is in the task force. Um, as Community events go on, you'll see that there is latest posts, which you can't see in on this one because this is a screenshot, and any other information that is pertinent to the task force will be posted on this site. Does anybody have any questions? Good, it's time to go. Now I'll just play. Um, it's been a real honor and a real pleasure to be able to help out. We uh, really like this organization. And it, is our, and it is our pleasure to be able to do this for the task force. Thank you. Joey said that uh, he's gonna be presenting last and he would deliver it. He sure did. Great story, great story, great presentation. Uh, last words of uh, CEs. Uh, make sure you turn them in. I'll be in the back when they hand them in, and I'll be taking the uh, uh, person profiles also. And on the last page of the agenda at the bottom is my name, number, and email address. If you have any questions regarding CEs, uh, go ahead and uh, email me or contact me, and I will help you out and answer your questions. Also on your, on your table uh, are a couple of handouts for registrations for the uh, Medical Legal Conference on Aging and Aging Summit that we have uh, coming up on October 10th and 11th. And if you're interested uh, for, or you want some more information, go ahead and contact me or visit our, our uh, website uh, so you can get more information. There is no evaluation form. There is none. Everything is online. Um, you'll give me the statement of attendance. I will confirm that you attended. I will email you a evaluation. You will complete the evaluation and you will receive your certificate via email. Uh, allow anywhere from uh, two to three weeks for completion. Again, if you have more questions, uh, go ahead and contact me. Thank you, everyone. Um, and thank you, everybody, for just uh, uh, hanging in there with us all day long. And, and we love seeing you all every year. We're, we're proud of this turnout this year and hope to see all of you all again next year. Please uh, take a look at our website. I'm actually going to be working on it to add a lot more information, contacts and advocacy. And we hope to build bridges with each and every person that's here. And thank you again for your support. And we couldn't do it without you. Have a great weekend. Just a quick reminder, tomorrow's the Alzheimer's Walk. So if anybody's interested, show up at AT&T Center.